But really, when it comes down to it, it's like, you know, I don't think there's anything more powerful than, you know, a shared experience. And so the opportunity we have you know, every 30 or 45 or 60 minutes to sit across from another human being and have an experience together every week, you know, and then the accumulation of those experiences, you know, to the point where, you know, by the time a student graduates high school, you know, we've spent hundreds of hours together. Hello, teachers, and welcome back to another episode of the TopCast, your music teaching podcast. This is episode number 231. And in today's episode, we are connecting with the fabulous Christina Whitlock, who recently has started a new podcast. And I wanted to unpack how she came to start her new podcast and some of her own ideas about um, her passions and how she's helping teachers through her work online. Uh, She's got some great stories to tell. We talk about um, how she feels about the impacts that we can have on students' lives as teachers. We talk about the web of influence and also about how we can combat burnout and talk about some of those things that can really bring us together as a community. And then we'll talk a little bit more about her podcast as well. I'm really excited to introduce you to Christina. It's a great fun conversation and I know you'll get lots out of it. Christina Whitlock operates a lively independent piano studio in addition to teaching adjuncts at Taylor University. Christina is a past state president of the Indiana Music Teachers Association, as well as a frequent speaker, adjudicator and collaborator. Her passion for celebrating the music teaching profession has recently spilled over into a weekly podcast titled Beyond Measure with Christina Whitlock. We're going to unpack a little bit more about that later on, but in the meantime, welcome to the show, Christina. So great to be able to hang out with you for a little bit. Thank you, Tim. I've been looking forward to it. Me too. And I can't wait to dive into more about what you do and your podcast, all that great stuff. But to start with, I would love to know a little bit about how you came into teaching because everyone's got a story of some sort. What's your (laughs) one one like? Well, my story is a little interesting. Um, I know a lot of piano teachers get started at a very early age. And um, I'm no different. But um, I'll tell you kind of the short version. But my dad, who was my biggest cheerleader in life, always, um, had a little bit of an impulse spending problem. (laughs) Not too extreme, but, you know, I I imagine he was challenging for my mom in that regard. Um, But he went out one day just before my 14th birthday on the search for a new washing machine. And he had my brother, who's about three years older than I am with him. And they ended up at the music store, you know, a few cities over, and he ended up buying me a baby grand piano, this beautiful (laughs) Hawaii piano. Um, He went out, hang on, he went out for a washing machine. Yes. Um, (laughs) And of course, this is before cell phones, so it's not like he checked with my mom, uh, you know, and he just kind of got taken on this, like, oh, you know, she works so hard, let's get her this piano. Um, And (laughs) In the meantime, tells my brother he can move to the basement so we can put the piano in his room, like this whole thing. So my brother's pumped and my mom has no idea. So (laughs) he comes home and he says, you're either going to be really happy or really upset. And my mom said, I told you to buy an inexpensive washing machine. And he goes, oh, I did. (laughs) (laughs) But I also bought Chrissy a piano. And (laughs) she was like, what? (laughs) And bless her heart. She's like, well, she has to try it. She has to know if she likes it and if it's good. And, you know, we can't just get her this piano, this big investment. And, you know, bless her heart for thinking that my 14 year old self knew anything about good quality (laughs) pianos because (laughs) I was just like, yay. (laughs) So anyway, he takes me to the store, you know, has me try it out. Of course, I'm like, yes, I love it. And the music store owner came over and he said, hey, we need a piano teacher. Would you come teach at my store? And Speaking to you as a 14-year-old. Yes, speaking to 14-year-old me. And of course, that was like super flattering. And I just thought, oh, I must be the best ever. But that store was a few, you know, I mean, it was a good 40 minutes away. And of course, I was 14. I didn't drive. So uh, my dad happened to own a business where we lived, um, that was next door to the local music store. And that teacher, as soon as he caught wind that I got offered to teach at this other store, (laughs) of course, came knocking at my door and said, oh, hey, we need a piano teacher. And 
I was thinking I'd wait till you were older, but I think we should just go ahead and start now. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, but you have to understand, I lived in a very small town, like minuscule. <laughs> and the only other teacher in the area was my teacher. And so when she was full, like there was no one. So there's 14 year old me teaching at the music store, you know, 30 students right out the gate. Oh my goodness. And <laughs> My first, oh, you'll love this. My first student was my best friend's ex boyfriend. Like, Damn. first student was, was your ex friend's ex my, my best friend's ex boyfriend. Best friend's ex boyfriend. Okay. So, That's a bit weird. Like, huge drama at age 14 to have oh a goodness. student show up that was your best friend's ex boyfriend. Super weird. But anyway, so just funny small town stuff. What a story. Uh, because, but, and I'm so thankful for those years, but I can't believe anyone stayed with me, but they really did. Uh, you know, and I, maybe it's just because they had no other options. Um, but you know, I had adult students that studied with me for those years that really solidified a love I have of adult students. And I can't imagine as my grown up self, like going to a 14 year old that was mm. clearly inept, <laughs> not to mention the fact, this is funny, the store only stocked Bastion piano books, you know? And right. So, like, I would teach adults out of, like, the pink Bastion uh, printer. <laughs> it's like in so class funny. number one of piano teaching these days, don't teach what? adults the beginner method. No, no, of course not. But, you know, they, they sat there and, you know, played their little songs. It was so great. And anyway. What an extraordinary story. How long did you stay there? Um, well, I stayed there um, until about my senior year of high school. So then I went on to do my uh, bachelor's degree in piano performance, and I was teaching at a store, you know, a different store um, there. And then I did a master's degree out here in Indiana, where I live now, in performance and pedagogy. And so obviously kept teaching then. And so now I'm looking at, you know, it'll be 25 years of teaching in June. Oh, my goodness which is a good chunk of my life. So yeah. I love it because as we all know, experience accounts for so much. And so I, I, you know, worked a lot of those pieces out on my own. Um, but of course I also like feel like I owe a lot of people their money back because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I feel like that about my first student too. <laughs> well, I think we all do. Yeah. And, and that's what I love is I feel like I've been every teacher, you know, like I've been the teacher who, you know, sometimes gets the side eye from the experienced teachers, you know, mm-hmm. and instead I'm a big, you know, I'm like, no, let's like come along beside them and, you know, help build them up and connect with those younger teachers because we do need them. <laughs> we do need them up and coming. Um, but, and I was fortunate to have several teachers that came along beside me and helped mentor me along the way. And um, I'm so thankful. When, when you first started at age six, 14, sorry, 14. which I think is a record. I don't think I've ever interviewed anyone under the who started <laughs> below 16. So you, you are the record, current record holder. Um, right. What did you do teaching wise? Did you, like, you just, I assume, like we all do, you just started teaching how you remember you were taught. Right. Mm. Sure. And, you know, and it was interesting because, of course, like I said, small town and I was still, you know, my first teacher, I was with her for 10 years. So I was still taking lessons with her, you know, as I was, you know, at this music store. And she started out teaching at that music store before she kind of branched off Mm. on her own. So we had, I mean, we would spend most of our lessons just like kind of like trading stories at that point. (laughs) My later lessons got a little bit less productive with her. Yeah. But, you know, so it was great. I mean, she would, she would kind of help me, but it was, you know, kind of quintessential, you know, she had um, performance degrees in piano and voice, but, you know, I mean, there was a lot I didn't learn in terms of technique and, and those kinds of things. So, I mean, I was literally, you know, I was rocking those Bastion books and just turning the page and turning Mm -hmm. the page and Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's all the music store stocked. And that's all I knew at that point. So that's what I did. And it was, you know, and I'm so like anti just turn the next page of the method book. Right the book. now. <laughs> That's yeah. so not my thing. Yeah. So, um, but you know, live and learn. <laughs> yeah. I, I really value the fact that you have, you, you've been all those teachers. I really like that you use that phrase. You've been the 14 year old with no idea teaching just how you were taught with one <laughs> method book. You then had more experience. You learned more. You taught more. You then had a bachelor's experience and you taught with that. And now you mm-hmm. eventually did a pedagogy and a master's. And so you've mm-hmm. got much 
greater variety of what you do and your understanding of how it all works. So mm-hmm. I, I think there is just so much to learn from someone like you who has been through all those stages. I think it's quite remarkable. And to have taught for 25 years and you only look about, what, 30? <laughs> so 38, 38, Tim. 40 is a knock-in. <laughs> well done anyway. Well, tell us about what you're doing right now then. Sure. Well, so I have 40 students at home. 40, 4 zero. Four zero. Um, so That's a decent number of students. It's a decent studio. Um, mm. They're great. I really have just come into a point where I literally teach the best families in my area. I really do. And so I also teach adjunct at Taylor University, which is a private college here um, north of me. Um, and so I teach the pedagogy course cycle there. Um, I'm teaching piano literature this semester. Um, I teach applied lessons as well and um, do a few other things for them. So that's running around. I serve on a lot of different boards. Um, I was an Indiana state president of our state MTA uh, for a term. Uh, you know, I just keep my hands in a lot of, you know, pies like so many of us do. Mm, <laughs> None absolutely. of us are good at holding down one gig, you know? We all do so much. It's the portfolio <laughs> career of any musician slash music teacher. It's what we do. That's right. It is. I was just going to say, we'll find out later on about your latest venture, which is your podcast, which I'm very yeah, keen to tell everyone about so as fun. well. Well, thank you. It is fun to do. And 40 students, it's all one-on-one. You don't do groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you mainly do, or you do do groups as well? Tell us about the mix. Oh, sorry. No, um, no, they're all private students. Um, okay. We, in non-pandemic times, do group meetings every six weeks or so. But okay. that is not happening right now. I've been online with them since March exclusively. So it's been a long 10 months. <laughs> yeah, sure. 11 now. Um, yes, and are they mainly 30 minute or 45s? What do you do? They're all over the place. Um, I will say I have 30, 45, and 60-minute students. For the most part, um, a few years ago when I had my my second child, because I've got two girls, uh, they're four and 10. And when I had the youngest, I was at a point where I had to cut back, but I had no students that I really wanted to let go. Um, again, incredibly fortunate position to be in. Mm. I couldn't part with any of them. So I bumped most of my 45-minute students back to 30 minutes just so I could keep everybody. Mm. And that's what we've done. So I do some of my homeschoolers and adults who come during the day, they have longer lessons. I'd certainly rather have 45 to 60-minute lessons, but you know, you make I love work. all these kids too much, so <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> the passion comes through. I actually want to talk about passions. Um, what what sure. would you say your your biggest passions are as a music teacher? Well, I would say I have two. So I would say, um, you know, it's that potential for connection and relationship with our students. And I would say it's also coming alongside other teachers and helping them get the work done. Um, but I really think that the biggest blessing to me of this career that, again, you know, I kind of stumbled into and then just never left um, is just, you know, I don't know. I believe in all those fundamental, important things about the study of music, right? I think like music is just, you know, fundamental to the human soul and, you know, music for the sake of music and all these things. But really, when it comes down to it, it's like, you know, I don't think there's anything more powerful than, you know, a shared experience. And so the opportunity we have you know, every 30 or 45 or 60 minutes to sit across from another human being and have an experience together every week, you know, and then the accumulation of those experiences, you know, to the point where, you know, by the time a student graduates high school, you know, we've spent hundreds of hours together, you know, and I just think that is just so incredible, (laughs) Mm. you know, and that to me just never gets old. And as a parent now, I mean, I can respect how difficult it is to let your children build relationships with other adults um, because there's so many things to be scared about (laughs) in that regard. And so now to feel that as a safe place, you know, or to know that people see me as a safe place and to get affirmed in that, you know, so many times in my life already is just so incredible. Mm. And so I'm just so thankful for that. I've often talked about how, uh, while it's really easy to get uh, down sometimes about teaching because it is exhausting and it's quite relentless mm-hmm. and it's, it is easy to burn out if you're teaching a lot, 
one of the things we are incredibly lucky to be doing is one we are we're teaching our passion for most of us with the reason we're doing this is because right. we love music and we love piano and we we get this opportunity to be one-on-one with students which no other teacher really these days gets to do not even karate or dance class they're all groups so this is one of the few places where a child has a relationship one-on-one with another adult who's not their parents. And I think, I agree with you, I think the influence we can have through that relationship is is quite extraordinary. It is. I'll tell you a story. Um, so I live, where I live in Indiana, our school district has been in a lot of turmoil over the last few years. Mm. We live in a an incredibly economically diverse community. So we've got a lot of people under the poverty line and and everywhere in between. And our school systems have been struggling, not from our teachers because they're phenomenal, but just from a lot of dynamics. And there's been this giant emphasis on more community support of our students. And we had this program um, probably two years ago now, uh, where a speaker came in and they presented this research. And I couldn't be there, but I was talking to a friend of mine the next day who happens to be a parent of one of my students. And she was saying, this is the research that they had, um, that basically they looked at student success rates. So they're looking at, you know, graduation records and employment placement later in life and all these things. And they studied all these different indicators for what was going to, you know, trigger a student to be most successful. And what they came down to was it wasn't money and it wasn't grades. And it wasn't economic status or, um, you know, two parent households or any of those things. But it was the students that proved to be successful had what they called this web of influence. And Mm. it was basically they had like around five people that were not related to them that were present in their lives and that connected with them and helped them, you know, come into their own and feel you know, comfortable in their learning and in their growth and and just safe, you know, and she was telling me this and already I'm like on board because I'm like, yes, this is what I do. (laughs) And she looked at me and she said, Christina, you're the first person I thought of. And I was so thankful for you because that's what you do for all these students. She said, you are that person, like you're their, their web of influence. And oh my goodness, I just bawled. (laughs) I was, I believe that though. Mm. And I see it, you know, it is so important. Even the students that, you know, are a little bit troublemakers or (laughs) a little bit misbehaved. Like I recognize how they change when they see that I'm invested in them and that I believe in them. And I just, I adore that. And it's so important for what we do, Mm. you know? And I feel like sometimes teachers get real caught up in like, well, I just get rid of the kids that don't behave or the kids that I don't like. And we're all allowed to run our businesses however we want. Or the ones that don't practice. Exactly. Yeah, sure. (laughs) You know, and that's, believe me, we all get to run our business the way we want to run it. And we're all very different kinds of teachers. And that's, you know, I don't, I pass no judgment, but (laughs) Mm. I personally, I like to have a few challengers in the mix. I just feel like it keeps me fresh and it, it, they feed me. They really do. Cause Mm. you know, you just get to see them come alive, but even, you know, anyway, but yeah, I just thought that was really great. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It really uh, brought home the meaning, and and this it, you feel so passionately about this, so it makes a lot of sense that that would have had that effect on you. And uh, yeah, I think it, it's a great reminder to all of us who are working day to day and slogging it out with our students of just the impact that we can be having. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Well, I think we all, you know, anyone who's been teaching for a decent amount of time has probably had that experience where a student comes back to you or writes you a letter or something and and you just d- never realized how much of an impact mm. sometimes it's the quietest students or the ones that you don't think are paying attention or getting it or don't feel like you're connecting with them and actually you know i mean you're a big deal in their life you really are and you think about again those shared experiences that we have you know and anything performance related you know that's memorable for students and mm. for us to be able to be part of that I just, I don't know. I just love that. I love that I'm part of so many important memories for so many students. I just, Mm. anyway, I just feel really fortunate (laughs) to be able to do that. (laughs) Now you've, um, as an, as a a real example of this, uh, influence Mm -hmm. that teachers can have, you've got another story of a teacher that you know, well, I think. (laughs) I do. 
Well, I just feel like it's a good time to tie in, you know, the here in piano teacher world, we're kind of mourning, uh, are mourning the loss of Nalita True, who was just this incredible legacy. I mean, I'm kind of obsessed with the idea of legacy anyway. That's a whole other conversation. Mm. But I, and the funny thing is, is I didn't even study with her personally, but I studied one of my most influential teachers was a man by the name of Tommy Otten and Tommy studied with her. She was one of his, um, you know, primary teachers and someone who saw a lot in him. And he was very good to, you know, kind of credit her with all the things like whenever he would teach us something, he'd be like, well, this is what Nalita says. And, and uh, it was so, so impactful. And when I was a sophomore in undergrad, um, I got to play for her for a master class. And it was literally like one of the highlights of my performance life. <laughs> and one of my friends even commented to me, like that had also played that day. She was like, we're going to tell our kids about this someday. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, that's a little dramatic. <laughs> but, but actually, guess what I, the story I told a couple weeks ago uh, to my kids. <laughs> because she just, here's a teacher who, you know, I mean, she taught at the University of Maryland. She taught at Eastman, uh, taught at Interlochen for many years, you know, and, and just had this worldwide influence, right? And she was internationally renowned. She has received every you know, honor of distinguishment she could get, you know, <laughs> she just was, I don't know, a total superstar. But when you worked with her, I mean, she, she never talked down to you. I watched her work with students who, you know, really needed to up their game. I've watched her work with masterful students and she approached each one with, you know, this sense of dignity and of artistry and of this expectation that we can all, you know, be our best musical selves. And she was just so smart. She just had the way of boiling down really complex com mm. you know, concepts into really simple things. Um, you know, short notes lead to long notes. And that's how phrases are built. And all of these things that impact my teaching every day. And, you know, again, this is someone that I had one master class with, <laughs> yep. you know, but I studied with a student of hers and her ideas lived on through him. And now they live on through me because I use them every day. And I just think that's so incredible that now, of course, you know, my students, whether they go into be piano teachers or not, there's just so many things about what we do together that then live out through their lives and mm. shape who they, how they see themselves as learners and as artists. And I mean, again, I just want to like give the piano teacher world a big hug. because It's just <laughs> like, wow, look at what we do, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how I, I hear myself saying things that my teacher teachers Absolutely. taught me as well and I teach those to not only my students but also if I do a video about something I'll use these phrases uh, because there are some uh, one of the skills of a truly truly amazing teacher particularly when they're doing more advanced music is that ability to distill things to the simplest es essence and be able to not just do that but find the connection that the student will understand because that's not always going to be the same for every student. And the use of metaphor, I think, is just, I, when I hear it, see a master in action teaching, the, the use of yeah. metaphor to get the sound that they want is, I'm in awe of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. One of the things she said once in a master class that I watched is, you know, the student was playing Mozart and it was a passage where there was the melody and then the melody was joined in parallel thirds. And she said, oh, look, your melody has a friend. And mm. <laughs> I use this image of, of your melody having a friend and I'm like all the time. And I just, it was so joyful. Mm. And so playful. And yet there's this woman with every, again, you know, every distinguished <laughs> award possible. <laughs> it was just so relatable. And, you know, even just her speech, you know, uh, there's, I was just, anyway, it's just, I loved her. So, and, and again, this is someone I met a very small handful of times mm. and has had such a profound influence on me. And so, I don't know, I just want to, you know, encourage other teachers that, hey, look, we're doing good work. <laughs> we really are. That's right. And no matter how hard it gets, you never know quite what you say or do or whatever it is, even on your worst day, you might have that breakthrough moment with a student. You may never know about it until 10 years later or never, who knows, but keep doing what you're Absolutely. doing because it has a huge impact. I think that's an important point to make. So I'm keen to just uh, cycle back because you mentioned two missions. The second one was about championing, championing 
teachers. <laughs> so mm-hmm. tell us what what made you decide to start putting out things for teachers and start working more with teachers? Sure. Well, I'll tell you, I guess coming from my background and appreciating the fact that I had teachers who invested in me as a, as I was learning to teach and came along beside me instead of, you know, just going, what does this kid think she's doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, the talking down know. to, yeah. Right. And so I think that that spawned it in me, but I'll tell you, I think during this pandemic, I really hit a point where I, mean, I was very touched at the onset of this, you know, when we were just kind of starting to figure out that life was going to take a big curveball, you know, there were so many teachers that just came out of the woodwork to share their ideas, you know, teachers that were already in the online teaching space, um, you know, composers and publishers and all these people that just Mm. came out to offer up their ideas and what they were doing for lesson planning and tips and And I just thought, you know, not every profession does this, (laughs) you know, a lot of times people are trying to edge each other out, you know, Mm. well, I'm going to be the best at this. So I'm not sharing that. Um, And I just feel like we're very much not that way, you know, I mean, and obviously people need to take credit for their work, but (laughs) Mm. I have just benefited so much from the generosity of this community of teachers that we're part of. And I just felt like it was my time to really kind of jump in and start giving back in a bigger way. So, you know, I've been doing conference presentations for a while and, you know, different guest stints here and there, Mm -hmm. but um, I've had this idea for this podcast kicking around in my brain for like eons, like many (laughs) years. And I was finally like, you know what? pandemic life you, you did it let's do this <laughs> yeah yeah so um so yeah so i started a podcast back in october and it's basically just designed to help independent teachers feel like they have time with another piano teacher <laughs> like, you know mm, i like it because you say something um at the start about you know i'm your Anytime piano teacher friend. Yeah, that's right. I really like that approach. And I love well, that your your podcast is you know, it's really different to anything that I've produced. It's 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 a completely different style, uh, different length. So yeah, you, you must tell us about what <laughs> what, what the approach is, because uh, I want to encourage people to go and have a listen. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Well, teachers are my people. <laughs> um, and I just know for me that you know, we're also the busiest people I know, but yet whether we're talking about teaching or not, like there's an energy that comes from music teachers that I need more of in my life. So my attempt at giving back is, you know, throwing myself out there. And, you know, through that, I've already made a lot of new piano teacher friends who Mm. I, you know, wouldn't have otherwise met. So Mm. it's a bonus for me. But honestly, you know, you mentioned burnout earlier, and that's a huge part of it. You know, if you look at, you know, school teachers who, of course, have so much on their plates, they're, anyway, I admire them so much, but, you know, they have teachers lounges and they have, you know, not that they would say staff meetings are a bonding experience, but they're together, you know, and they (laughs) see, right? (laughs) But they see every day that there are people here doing the same thing. I think that there Mm. is a real beauty in that. And of course, as independent teachers, we don't see that very often. And I know for me, there were times where I just felt really isolated in what I do, even though we spend time with people all the time, but, you know, but we're giving and giving and giving. And um, I just, I remember my first MPNA conference in Seattle. I was like, oh my gosh, there's all these people that do what I do. (laughs) It was so eye-opening to me. And, um, you know, I was like, wow, (laughs) I've always been the only person in my circle that does what I do, you know? And so I was, I don't know. I just found that really empowering. So Mm. I just think we need each other and we need like safe spaces that aren't judgmental. And like I said, I'm very much like everybody gets to run their business the way they want to run it. I'll show you how I do mine and what I think. And that's that. (laughs) So, Mm. yeah. So it's, it's, it's taking the best of the buzz that you get from conferences by just hanging out with other teachers and chatting. It doesn't even really matter what you're talking about. Just, just to hang out with, your people uh and you're trying to you're bringing that to the beyond measure podcast in little 20 minute blocks with you talking about particular topics what are some of the topics that you've you've unpacked 
Well, we've been a little all over the map to start with, but, um, you know, we talked about celebrating teachers, obviously. Mm. Uh, we've talked about quiet students. We've talked about um, all kinds of things. Um, in January, I did a four um, episode set on like self-reflection questions and like kind of more deep thinking things. Mm. Um, you know, we've had some funny episodes and I just try to keep it fairly varied for now. And I've got like 85 episodes drafted already. So, you know, I've got a lot of territory to cover. 85 episodes. Oh, my goodness. I told you I've been planning this a long time, Tim. Wow. <laughs> what was your hesitation? Why didn't you start earlier? I know the oh, pandemic man. was the catalyst, but why didn't you start it earlier? Well, oh, gosh, all kinds of reasons. <laughs> um, that negative well, obviously voice busy. in your head, you know, I mean, that that voice that says, like, you know, no one cares what you have to say. Like, you know, we've all got an opinion. We've all got experiences. You know, what mm. makes yours more valuable to put out there? And in time, you know, there's that whole that whole time puzzle. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, honestly, I really got hung up on, like, the end game. Like, okay, so I'm supposed, you know, so I have this podcast. I build a following. And then what do I want to do with that? You know, I think, you know, the business people will, you know, will tell you, all right, you got to capitalize on this thing that you're building. And, you know, I've got all these ideas. I've got books I want to write. And I've got, you know, courses I'd put together. And, oh, I mean, the list is really obscene what all I want to do. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I couldn't figure out where it was going. And then I was like, oh, maybe you just do it and find out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's maybe, it. See if people even care about what you have to say. And they do. Mm -hmm. And that's really great. Like, I'm super happy that the bulk of my listeners are not people I actually know in real life. <laughs> so I feel like that's a real compliment that, um, you know, people aren't just listening to because they feel bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I've been really, really happy about that. <laughs> I, I and I, I give credit to anyone who you know takes an idea and just starts it because you do that, that, that often taking that first step is is the hardest part because of those as you say the negative self talk or the I don't really have time or I don't really know where this is going but you know that's mm -hmm. okay uh, I started blogging in 2010 with uh, wow. absolutely no no plan for anything. And I just started getting those ideas out there like you did and people started reacting to it and then then you start to work out where things might go in the future. But, yeah. you know, it's it's just great that you've been able to make a start. So congratulations on doing that. Have you got uh, out of your 85 episodes in your head, have you got a couple that you can share with us, a couple of topics that are coming up in the future? Well, yes, I'll tell you what. Um, I've got a another episode of of humorous stories coming out very soon. Um, things I want to cover. I mean, I've got some like outside the box recital ideas we'll talk about. Um, I've got some different things I do with my studio calendar that I think will be really helpful for people just to kind of step outside of what they currently do just to explore different ideas. Um, and those are things I'm really excited about, but more just, you know, the day to day stuff that, you mm. know, that kind of catches us up. And again, I know, you know, you have student after student and it, it does get exhausting and, you know, the, you know, and we all just have so much expectation on ourselves. This is another thing I'm super passionate about is mm. just that, you know, we feel this pressure. Most of us tend to be pretty like perfectionistic, right? Types of people. And we want to do the very best every single moment, every single day. And, you know, like just this last week, I was teaching a concept and it was, uh, you know, again, we're all online. And I had this student whose parent was sitting there and I was going over this concept and I don't even remember what it was, but I just knew the student wasn't really getting it. And I'm a big fan of saying the same, you know, knowing like 16 different ways to teach the same thing. So you can kind of keep, mm. you know, pulling tools out of your toolbox, you know, <laughs> but he just wasn't getting it. And we ended the lesson, you know, we pivoted and did something else. And then I was like really beating myself up and I'm like, oh, I'm sure their parent is, you know, really wondering what on earth I was talking about. And well, you know, and I was like, goodness, it's one concept, <laughs> one mm, like mm. two minute blip out of that one lesson that right. the parent doesn't even know what we were talking about. So I'm mm. sure they didn't think it was bad, but I'm so terrible about that, Tim. I'm so bad about, you know, like wanting everything to be perfect. Mm. Yeah. You've got to be easy. Go easy on yourself. Don't you? I know, I'm saying right? that to everyone. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. 
And that's, that's kind of like the catch 22, I think of musicians is that most of us get to the point where we are because we hold ourselves to high standards. Right. But Mm. at the same time, then we make ourselves miserable because we can't Mm. hold up. So anyway, that's another one of my like big passions that I try. I talk to my students about all the time, you know, and Mm. also to my teacher friends. And the other thing is too, the the more we go online, the more there is chance for things to just not work. And also the more right. creative we get and the more off the page and out of the books we get, the more of chance course. there is for things to fail. So you have to really give yourself the opportunity to not have a perfect lesson. And I think that's totally okay. Absolutely. I like to say like if you end your student's lesson and they feel capable and they feel accountable, and they feel invested in, then we're good to go, right? Mm, (laughs) That's it, yeah. And it doesn't have to be perfect lessons every time, but it's, you know, it's the the sum of the whole, right? (laughs) That's exactly right, yeah. Well, Christina, um, it's been an absolute pleasure having a chat with you and a pretty free-flowing conversation, which I've really enjoyed, just sort of picking up some of the threads of your passions, uh, which people can, I mean, you can hear in your voice and people can hear more of on your podcast. So tell us where people can go to find out more about your podcast and listen to it. Well, it's so sweet of you, Tim, because I've had the best time talking to you. So you can find my podcast anywhere that you listen to your podcasts. It is called Beyond Measure with Christina Whitlock. And you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook at Beyond Measure Podcast. And yeah, let me be your anytime piano teacher friend. I'll be super excited. (laughs) I love it. Well, it's been a pleasure, as I said, Christina. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for all that you're doing for the teachers of the world. You said, uh, or I've, I've heard you say before, teachers are your people and it really yeah. comes through in, in everything that you're doing and, and putting together this show. I know how long it takes to put podcasts together, particularly when they're solo shows and you've got to create all that content and decide what to say and how you, it's going to work together. So uh, thank you on behalf of all the teachers who are listening for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Tim. That's so kind. Well, I hope you'll go and check out Christina's podcast, have a listen to her episodes. They're a little bit shorter than mine, generally around 20 to 25 minutes. And she can be your new teaching friend online that you can check in with whenever you'd like. Until next time, I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to the Topcast from topmusic.co. I'll speak to you soon. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.